Well, welcome to Bible study, everybody. Glad you are all here. We're going to continue in our series of teaching in Ephesians chapter 2. Today, I want to teach about changing for the better, about changing for the better. Um, that's a blessing, right, that God positions us to change for the better. And, and, and Paul, as he writes to the church at Ephesus, is going to teach us how this looks and what happened. And so let me lead us in a word of prayer. 
And then I want to invite you to meet me at Ephesians chapter two and the first three verses. Let's talk to the Lord. God, you've been our dwelling place in all generations from everlasting to everlasting. You are God. Thank you for the opportunity to gather as sons and daughters, even as we are about to learn in Bible study today. Thank you that we are your sons and your daughters. It was not always that way. Thank you for every door you've opened. Thank you for the opportunity to grow together as a family. Thank you for this wonderful community that we call Word Tabernacle. Thank you for our journey. Even now, God, as you've placed us in the context of a journey that doesn't allow us to gather physically, we recognize, God, we are still gathering. We are still gathering because we know that your church is not simply local, but your church is also universal and it is invisible. So thank you for this ecclesia. Thank you for this called out body of people who gather themselves together collectively known as Word Tabernacle Church. Would you bless every church whose doors are opened in your name, God? Would you show yourself mighty in the lives of people? Give us your spirit. We might clearly divide your word that we might put a handle on that word, that we might live it out in our lives. Speak, Lord. We're listening. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Ephesians chapter 2. And uh, unlike many Bible studies and many of um, our Orthos podcasts, I usually have a lot of introductory notes. Today, I just have one point of introduction. And then I have about five sub points that I want to share with you. Ephesians chapter two, beginning at verse number one, the pericope of my Bible really gives us a snapshot of what we're about to see, particularly next week when we get to this part portion of it. But it talks about by grace through faith. And here in chapter two, verse one, we find these words. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. You'll notice verse four begins with, but God, but God, rich in mercy. That, that's next week. So before we get to the but God of verse four, I want to unpack these first three verses. And, and I, I just have to warn you, this is not a Bible study that's going to really make us feel good about us. It's a Bible study that's going to make us feel great about who God is. And, and one of the things that I think Paul does as we look at Ephesians chapter two, is one of the things that Paul does is that Paul recognizes if you are really aware of how you came to the Lord, if you are really aware of the condition he found you, if you're really aware of how much he's pulled you out of, then the loyalty that you have to him is going to change because he says, I don't know that you realize how desperately you needed God. I don't know that you got it. And I want to give you a clear picture of who you really are without Jesus. And so he begins to say some things to us. And I want to I want to make an introductory statement around this whole conversation of changing for the better. Here's my first point for the introduction and really my only introductory point. Sin should be understood as an act against God. It's really important. As Paul writes here in Ephesians chapter two, over and over again, he starts talking about following the course of the world, following the wrong spirit, being a son of disobedience, he references trespasses and sins that I'm going to unpack in just a moment. Family, I want to say something because I, and I need to tell you this. Regardless of when you are watching or listening to this, I'm teaching it 
at a moment where we're about to enter into 40 days of Lenten season. But this is applicable any time throughout the year. But I'm particularly excited that the Holy Spirit has us in this place as we embark upon Ash Wednesday and the Lenten season. Because, because in a very real way, Ash Wednesday, the Lenten season, should really be a season of reflection, a season of repentance. It's why we impose ashes on our foreheads as a reminder that we are sinners saved by the grace of God, that we were in a destitute, desperate situation before God. And I, I want us to grab something. So oftentimes we view sin as against someone. But ultimately, sin needs to be understood as an act against God. I think we live in this society where we don't generally view sin as something that's directed against God. And I think we do ourselves a disservice with our modern day theologies and our modern day doctrines that are designed to give us uh, to give us what we want to taste, to give us, you know, to have those itching ears and to. Give me that word that I want to hear. And, and so I understand it the way I want to understand it. And we water it down and we dilute the scriptures. And we have to really be honest and give it to us straight, y'all. Give it to us straight. So when we begin to interpret sin and independent of a defiance against God, then we are now deviating from the biblical representation of sin. And I want us to understand the value of this and the severity of it because we were so desperately in need of God and because we came about so vile. And I'm going to explain it in a moment. When you and I now sin, whenever we have sinned, it is against God. I can't run the risk of being unforgiving to you because in my sinning against you and being unforgiving, I am sinning against God. And it's ultimately against God. God is saying, you're going to see how good God has been, how much God has brought me out of, how much God has brought you out of. And as I recognize that, the last thing I want to do now is enter back into a situation where I'm sinning against the very one that were it not for him, I would still be stuck in my less than situation. So understand that sin is ultimately act against God, which is why as we reflect and we repent, this Lenten season, we should be saying, God, what is in my life that needs to be stripped away, that needs to be cut away, that needs to be removed? How, do, how am I treating my fellow man? How, how am I loving people? Because, God, not only do I not want to sin against my brother, I don't want to sin against you. So keep that in the backdrop as we think through these, few three, these three verses. The title is... Changing for the better. I want to give you four or five areas of our lives that we have changed for the better because of Jesus. Here's the first one. The first one is in verse one. And, and the first declaration that I want us to make that is evidence that because of Christ, I've changed for the better. Say that to yourself. Say that about yourself. Because of Christ, I have changed for the better. Now. Here's the first area. I've changed for the better, number one, because I am no longer dead. I'm no longer dead. It, you, you probably did not realize you were dead, did you? Verse one. And you were dead. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked. And, and, and I want you to understand that when he says you are you are dead. He does not mean you're dying. He, dead, dead is we don't try to resuscitate you. Dead is the chemotherapy doesn't work. Dead is the, the medication doesn't work. Dead is the COVID vaccine is not for you. D dead is there's really nothing we can do for you. Now, let me tell you why I need to park here for just a moment. God is so different than all of us. Notice what he says. Because of Jesus, when I found you, you were dead. Not when I found you, you were dying. When I found you, you, could, you weren't breathing. You had no sign of life in you at all. Isn't it amazing that when you and I try 
to create our masterpieces because that's the title of this Bible study this year, right? Masterpiece in the making. That, that when you and I are trying to create masterpieces, we start off with the best material. We, we, we start off with the premier stuff. You know, I like to cook. And, and I, you know, there's some, there's some condiments, some seasonings, some, you know, things that I cook with where I don't like the generic brand. I, I, I don't like the, the cheap, you know, cheap stuff. Because sometimes when I'm cooking, man, I want to make sure I'm using the best possible ingredients so I can wind up with the best possible product. Watch this, but not God. God says, when I found you, there was nothing good about who you were. When I found you, you were dead. And he says two specific things about our death. He, he uses two different Greek words, and I don't normally give you the Greek words, but as I've been getting feedback from people, they're like, you know, you give us the Greek word, but, but it's not on the note sheet, and it'd be a whole lot help, more helpful, Pastor, if you know, we don't know how to spell these Greek words. Kind of help us out. He says, you were dead in, now watch these. You, we use these interchangeably. Paul uses them alongside of one another. The first Greek word that, we, that talks about our death is paratoma. It, it, it's the word here, trespass. He says, you were dead in paratoma. Now, this is a compound word in the Greek. And, and, and uh, para and toma and it literally means to fall away. Um, it, it means that you have fallen away from areas that you should have been walking straight up in. So you, there's been a falling away. He said, when I found you, you had already fallen away. Now, have you ever you ever um, 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 think about it from a um, he says, think about it from a practical perspective. If you drive down the street or if you look into a wooded area, if you look on a fence, it is not uncommon to see. A sign that says no trespassing. Right. We see that all the time. This is what this is what God is saying. He says, when I found you, you had already trespassed. When I found you, there was this paratoma. This there was areas in in your life where you were not capable of walking straight. You have you stepped out too far. You it's a paratoma. It's a trespass. And, and so he says, when I found you, you were dead in that stuff. You, you could not be recovered from it. But then he says trespasses and sins. Paratoma, the Greek word for trespass. And then sins, hamartona. Hamartona is the word for uh, sin that means missing the mark. He says, when I found you, you had already walked in a way that you shouldn't have walked. And, and I need you to get this. This is not occasional stuff. This is absolute. Like this is absolutely your being. Oftentimes trespasses has to do with an act and sin has to do with our being. He, he, he says, you ever heard somebody say somebody was found in sin? It, it, it's deeper than the actual act. It is literally your being. When I met you because before Jesus, you had stepped away too far. You've gone too far. And because of Jesus, your being was sin. Now, now, let me tell you why this matters. Who would find something dead, identify it as dead, clear that it's dead, and say, that, that, that's the one I want right there. That, that's the one I want. The one that's dead. Now, again, as I teach this, I want to increase your appreciation for how much God has done in your life and in my life. Y'all, y'all, this is what God is saying. He's saying, I found you, you were dead. When I found you, you had no value. When, when, I, when I found you, the, the, nobody wanted you. There, there was no potential in you. You were dead. God comes along and literally takes me on as I am, but thanks be to God, I am no longer dead. Everybody say, I'm no longer dead. And let me, can I throw this in for free? Whatever value we have, it's because of God. And you are valuable because of God. So don't let anyone convince you that you don't have value. The fact that God chose you 
as he chose you, recognizing how, how bad we were. He says, you are no longer dead. I'm getting better because of God. But then he says another thing. In verse 2, he says, not only am I no longer dead, he said, you were dead in the trespasses and sins which, in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air. The spirit is now at work, in the, that spirit is now at work in the sons of disobedience. Here's the second area of improvement. Not, not only am I no longer dead, number two, I'm no longer deluded. Everybody say, I'm no longer deluded. This is what Paul is saying now at verse two. At, at verse two, Paul is saying that before we accepted Christ, we were not only dead, but we were also dead to anything that was spiritual that I literally was following after the world system, that I was following after a whole nother power. It is one thing to be absolutely dead. It's another thing that, that no matter what I do, I don't even have the potential in me to follow good. Totally deluded. I want to say two things about this. The first thing that I want to say about this is that as we live this scripture out, contextually and practically in our lives, or I should say personally and practically in our lives. A couple things I want us to think about. The first thing that I want us to think about is that we must be aware of what spirit or attitude is prevailing. He said there was a time in which you once walked following the course, and I'm going to go back to course in a minute, of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work, in the sons of disobedience. He, he says, there was a time in your life before Jesus that, that you were pursuing the wrong spirit. You know, I, I talked a little bit about this last week. I'm going to, evidently the Holy Spirit just has me in this place and maybe because Paul emphasizes it over and over again in Ephesians. But we have to take a moment to really check out the spirit behind something to check out the attitude that is prevailing around. Have, have, you, ever, um, have, have you ever gone into a space and, and as soon as you walked in, you were just kind of like, man, it, something, the spirit in this place just is not right. Or you meet a person and other people are, you know, like them so much and think so much about them, but then something is kind of swirling around in you and it's just like, I, man, I can't put my hands on it, but it's just, Something about their spirit. It's, and, and not only could it be negative, in, 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 in another way, it could be how often have we met people, and praise God for folk like this, how often have we met people and, and we're like, man, I love her spirit. I love his spirit. How often times have we met people, it's wonderful, like something about them you know you can trust, something about them that you know is genuine. And, and what Paul is saying is that there was a time while we were in our deadness, that we were deluded totally, that we were walking after the wrong course and walking after the wrong spirit. And we've got to begin asking ourselves, what is the current attitude around me? What is the spirit that is prevailing? And I want to park here and say a few things about this because I think this is very important. How do we know when it's the spirit of God? How do we know when it's the right spirit? How do we know that when we get into a church, that church has the right spirit? How do I know when I get to the job and I'm with my group of people on my team that there's a right attitude or a right spirit that's prevailing? Let me say a few things about that. A couple, a couple of things we can test. And, and, and I'm always cautious about, you know, quoting test the spirit by the spirit and see if they of God. And let me tell you why. I, I'm, and we, sh we need to do that. But the reason I get, you know, a little careful with that is sometimes we can be so busy. Yeah, y'all can tweet this one out. Um, sometimes we can be so busy testing somebody else's spirit that we don't recognize my spirit is the problem. It's not always everybody else. Sometimes you 
are, you and somebody are rubbing each other the wrong way, not because their spirit is wrong, but because yours is wrong. Not because their agenda is wrong, but because yours is wrong. You know, there's a group of people, man, that just don't want to be around you if you are following God because they recognize light and dark. Just it's not going to dwell together. Oil and water is not going to mix. And, and so how do we know? Let me give you a few things. These are not in your notes, but let me give you a few things to process, a few things to think about when, to make sure that we no longer go back to this place of delusion, to make sure that we no longer go back to this place where we are, where we're allowing the wrong spirit and the wrong attitude to prevail. A couple things to consider. The, the, the first is just practical and personal now. I know it's the right spirit, the spirit of God, the spirit of Christ, when the word of God is being illuminated in my situation. When, when God's word is literally putting light on my situation, then, then I know, I know I'm at a point where the right spirit is prevailing. The, the other thing is I know it's the right spirit prevailing when God is clearly being exalted. You know, I, I want you to think about not just what we do, but how we do it. And if we think about not just what we do, but how we do it, let me ask you this question. Are you doing it with the right spirit? Is it the way you're doing it, the way you're doing it, is it exalting God? Is it, is it putting light? Is his word putting light on that situation? So, so I know that it's the spirit of God prevailing because, because God is being throned. He's being sat on the throne. He's being exalted. It, it, is, it is honoring him. My choice is honoring him. My attitude is honoring him. The way I treat you is honoring him. I know. So, so and I'm speaking to somebody, I, I, I can sense the Holy Spirit just kind of nudging me right here. Because there are people listening to this Bible study that you're so stuck in your anger and stuck in your vengeance, stuck in your attitude stuck in your ways, that you don't recognize that the, the spirit in which you are operating in is not the spirit of the Lord, that, that the spirit of the Lord does not allow anyone else but Jesus to be exalted. And here you are exalting your emotions. Mm. Hear the Lord. Here you are putting on the throne your own attitude. Put it, you're exalting your way of doing stuff. God is saying, don't exalt anything but Christ. And if in your situation, the spirit of Christ is not prevailing, then you need to you need to repent and no longer live deluded. Let me give you a third way, though. You know, it's the spirit of the Lord. You know, it's the spirit of the Lord when you have peace. You've heard me say so many times the devil cannot manufacture peace, real peace. Let me tell you why you should have peace. You're saying, but Pastor, I can't have peace in this thing because you don't know how tough it is right now. Let me tell you why you can have peace. And I've lived this out. I know it's true. Regardless of what the situation is, if it is the will of the Lord for you, the reason you can have peace in it is because God will either improve my predicament or he will improve my person. One more time. I have peace in it because God will either improve my predicament or he'll improve my person. In other words, if he doesn't change things around me, he'll change me. So I can have peace in it, whether that situation is getting better or whether I'm getting better in the midst. I know God has me so I can have peace in it. So Paul begins to write and say, listen, man, you, 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 you all have this great love, this great appreciation for the Lord, because when he met you, you were dead. When y'all met, you were deluded. And and. And you were deluded in following the spirits of this world and in, in following the attitudes of this world. Um, we have to be so careful that we don't get our cues. Matter of fact, let me go ahead. I was going to say get our cues off of the world. So let me give you my second sub point to this. That, that not only must we be aware of what spirit and attitude is prevailing, but we have to therefore guard our course. He says very clearly following the course of this world. Very important. Now, now, what does that mean? That this word course in the Greek is ion, A-I-O-N in the Greek. And it refers to um, an age. It refers to a period of time 
which certain spirits or certain attitudes prevail. Um, we have just concluded um, one of the most painful uh, presidencies in the United States history. And if you've ever paid attention, did you, have you noticed that in the past four years there was a different spirit in our nation? Hey, there's a different spirit in this community. It was, it was a period of time where certain spirits were allowed to prevail. So people that were racist, people that were, um, that, that, that hated people, people that um, celebrated um, inequity, those spirits were enabled to prevail. And how many times did we say to ourselves, wow, I didn't realize that was, that was a thing anymore. I didn't realize people really felt that way. I never thought this would happen. And I want you to understand this. They didn't suddenly become racist, but this is the first time in a long time, this is a great word for somebody, that they lived in a nation, they lived in an age, they lived in a course of the world that enabled that spirit or that attitude to prevail. It was literally that thing that was in them that had been dormant, that the spirit of this age was not allowing to, to, to surface. And then another spirit rose up. And in doing so, a group of people did exactly what is written here in verse number two. They walked and they followed the course of this world, which is why it's so important for those of us that have received the Lord Jesus Christ, that we must operate in the spirit of the Lord. Because if we don't operate in the spirit of the Lord, there's going to be another spirit, the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that's at work now in the sons of disobedience, according to the text. So if you and I don't live in a posture where, where we're operating in a spirit of wisdom and we're operating in a spirit of understanding, if we're not operating in a spirit of counsel, and of might and of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, then there will be another spirit of this world, this world system that will prevail. This is the danger of people who know Jesus being silent in the midst of our current culture. Those of us who know Christ, we must operate with that spirit of Christ. We must operate with that fruit of the spirit. We must operate. Let me ask you this question. How often times have you been in the midst of the spirit of the course of this world and said nothing? How many times have you been around the course of this world and, and did nothing, prayed nothing, offered nothing? And, and when we get in this moment of the course of this world, it is incumbent upon us that we operate with love. I mean, I'm, I'm going to get myself in trouble, but hey, you know what? This is Word Tabernacles Bible study, so... So and I'm glad y'all are listening, but I want you to grab this. This has been people's frustration with the evangelical church. Their frustration with the evangelical church is they began following the course of this world. They began following the prince of the power of the air. They began following the spirit that's now at work in the sons of disobedience. The very thing God was saying, I, I, I brought you out of all of that. You are allowing yourself to be deluded. He says, you, you should no longer be deluded. And if, you, if, I, if you're listening to me and you're not getting trapped in the spirit of this age, it is because you are growing for the better. That regardless of who is in power and regardless of who is in authority and regardless of who has controls and regardless of who has the wealth, that you do not allow yourself to operate with the spirit of this world. You are operating with the spirit of the Lord. I'll throw this in for free. When we make decisions as Christians, we can't live this out the way the world does. We, we don't manage our money like the world does. We don't, we don't, we don't marry, manage our, our, our marriages, treat our spouses like the world does. No, no, we operate with a spirit of wisdom. Everybody say a spirit of wisdom. You operate with a spirit of wisdom. You operate in a spirit of counsel where you get, jot these two or three things down, spirit of wisdom, number one. Number two, spirit of counsel. You know, where I'm seeking the counsel of the Lord before I make decisions. 
um, the, the spirit of understanding where I am seeking to understand God's purpose and plan in everything that I'm dealing with. Paul says to us, when, when without the Lord, you would be still deluded. I'm so grateful God has come along and rescued me. He has come along so I'm no longer following the wrong spirit. He says, were it not for the Lord, you still be dead. Were it not for the Lord, number two, you still be deluded. Number three, he says, were it not for the Lord. Um, um, and, and, and so let me, just, before I give you this third point, I, let me just say a, one more word about the guarding my course. And, and I've been trying to help this live, and I know some of us get nervous with this kind of teaching. But, but we have to be students of the spirit of this age and the spirit of the world. And we have to make sure that we're not allowing the spirit of the age, the spirit of the world to delude us. And you gotta be really careful. We, I mean, we have all kinds of issues around, around you know, I'll give you two touchy ones because I'm not, I'm not scared. I'm not scared, as we like to joke around and say. Um, you know, we have to be careful. The spirit of this age, the spirit of this world will say to us, well, because a woman should have a choice, you know, if she wants to abort a baby, no big deal. We as believers are no longer deluded. And we recognize that it is always desire of God to bring forth life. Right. So we don't get deluded by the agenda or the spirit of this age or the spirit of this world. Equal rights as it relates to gender. Yeah. I mean, women and men in God's eyes are both created um, in God's image. But God still gives us very distinct roles very distinct resources, very distinct anatomies. And we can't allow the spirit of this age and the spirit of this world to delude us. Okay, I know it's going to be a little, little controversial, but that's okay. Number three, not only am I no longer dead and I'm no longer deluded, but number three, I am no longer disobedient. I'm no longer disobedient. This is, this is why I love studying in the Greek when I'm reading the New Testament. I love studying the Greek because it makes some texts really live. And you read it one way, but then when you study it in a deeper dive, you start to realize it means something very different than you thought. Or you start to realize, here, this is really what I'm saying, that the words are stronger than I thought. That there's a force to the world, to the words that the translation in the, in the ESV didn't really give me. When we read verse two, we read it, and let me just look at the, 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 the end portion of verse two. Now at work in the sons of disobedience. So when we read that, Paul is not simply saying that we were disobedient children. The, the Greek wondering children literally is the word son, right? So that's in the ESV. So it's saying that this spirit is now at work in the sons of disobedience. In other words, it is a reference to the relationship to the father. Paul was saying we were sons of the disobedient one, Satan. See, you missed it. I told you who are now at work in the sons of disobedience. He he's saying not that I'm God's son that was disobedient to God. He was saying that my rebellion and my disobedience against God was an act of a son of Satan. This is I told you it was stronger than you realize. And, and so he's saying I'm no longer that child. He's saying I'm no longer a son of Satan. I'm no longer a son of disobedience. I'm no longer that person. And it's very important that we go ahead and do the paternity test. And we start looking at the attributes of the first Adam and the attributes of the second Adam and begin asking ourselves, what Adam am I acting like? 
Because I think a whole bunch of us claiming the second Adam, who is Jesus Christ, and that not being honest, that I'm really living and acting like a child of the first Adam. And we've got to take a look at our fruit and ask ourselves, whose child am I acting like? Because when I see certain people that call themselves sons of God, I start looking and say, well, I know, you know, you, you say you're a son of God, but you sure acting like a son of Satan. How many times have you seen folk and, and, and you like, you like, um... I don't know. I, I know you you say that's not your child, but sure look like it to me. You know, you, you look and say, I don't know, you look a whole lot like him. You look a whole lot like her. And, and so we got to be honest. Who do you really resemble? Who do you really look like? I'm going to park here for a moment because I think we all need it and it's going to make our church better. It's going to make us better. When, when you hold on to your anger, who do you really look like? When you hold on to your unforgiveness, who you really look like? When, when, you, when you operate in poor stewardship, who do you really look like? Think about it for just a moment. Can I just, can I just draw the parallels for just a moment? First, Adam. Because Romans teaches us that by one man, sin comes into the world, defiles the whole world. And by one man, Jesus Christ himself, we are saved from those sins. So in the first Adam, he commits all the wrong and takes none of the blame. He and his Wife Eve are at the garden, and he's like, hey, that wife you gave me, I, I didn't do this, man. I, I did all the dirt, but I'm not taking any blame. The first Adam doesn't assume any responsibility. The first Adam does not, does not do any of the things that honor God and glorify God. The second Adam, Jesus Christ, commits no sin. And then takes upon himself all of those sins, even though he himself has done nothing wrong and yet takes full responsibility. What a man. What a man. What a man. What a man that can that can do no wrong and take all the responsibility. What a man that can fix my wrong. Woo, man. What a man. Right. So he says, listen, I want you to understand this. He says, understand that you are no longer the disobedient one because of Christ. I'm not dead. I'm not deluded. I'm not disobedient. Uh, I mean, I got two more. So let me push fast. Number four, because of Christ, I'm no longer defiled. Verse number three. Now, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Whew, this is a whole lot here. Now, let me, let me go back because I, I want us to see something here. Who once lived out the passions of our flesh. Here's the word right here. Carrying out the desires. Everybody say def desires. Well, what, what he's saying is that I was before Christ, I was defiled by my natural desires. I was defiled by my lust of the flesh. I was defiled by... Um, um, and, and, and let me just let me say this. Let me say this, because I think we can easily misunderstand this. Carrying out the desires of the body. See, the assumption here is that every natural desire or every strong desire, that's really that word epithumia, that word desire, epithumia in the Greek. It doesn't just mean desire. It means strong desire. He's saying that. I'm no longer before Christ. My strong desires defiled me. Now, I want you to understand something. Just because you desire something doesn't mean it is evil. Not everything we desire is evil. He was saying that there are some things that I have a strong desire for that because of Christ became something that damaged me and hurt me. It became something that defiled me. Let me give you proof that not every strong desire is a bad thing. Do you remember when? Paul was writing to Timothy, and when Paul was writing to Timothy in 1 Timothy, I believe it was chapter 3, he's talking about the office of a bishop, and he says, if a man desire the office of a bishop, he desires a good work. So not everything that I strongly desire is evil, but if we're not careful without Christ, the very things that could be good if I, if I don't have a, a proper context for them and a proper boundaries for them, they can defile me. And sometimes we get defiled by our strong desire to have money. Or we get desired by our strong desire for sex. Or we get desired by our strong desire 
to have things or our strong desire to be liked by people or our strong desire to, have a, a be, to be popular. We have to be very careful. In Christ, I'm no longer defiled by those things. And then here's the last thing that has shown that we are getting better. The last thing is I'm no longer doomed. I'm no longer doomed. Among whom we all once lived in the past passions of the flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were, by nature, children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. He, he, he's saying that this was my condition. I was without Christ. I was without hope. I was without God. I was a sinner by birth. I was a sinner by choice. I was a sinner by practice. Oh, good Lord, I may need to say that over again. I was a sinner by birth. This is before Christ. I was a sinner by choice and I was a sinner by practice. And he says, because of that, my lot was cast in the world that I would be totally controlled by evil and my destiny would be under God's wrath and under God's curse. I'm going to give you something to shout about. Just just read the first, the very first word. Of the next verse. Just read the next the verse, verse four, the first two words, but God. Now, rewind it real quick. I was without God. I was without Christ. I was without hope. I was a sinner by birth. I was a sinner by choice. I was a sinner by practice. My lot in life had been cast, and I was gonna forever live under God's wrath and God's curse. But God. <laughs> But God, literally, he steps right in. Somebody need to write a song. Where is, where, let me, somebody say this to the praise scene. Y'all write a song called But God. I mean, think about it, right? Get, give me some music to a song called But God. I, I was all of this, but God. I didn't have any of this going for me, but God. And so before I get into all of the but God starting next week and everything that God did because he was rich in mercy, because of his great love, because he loved us, I want to give you three words to take home. Jot these down, and this will be the ending of Bible study today, the ending of this podcast. I want to give you these three words that I want us to begin working on. If you're listening to this and it's no longer Lent, still work on this. But I want to give you three words. Here's the first word. The first word I want you to jot down is appetite. Everybody say appetite. This Lenten season, or at this season in my life, God, I want to ask that you help us Develop a taste and develop a palate for what's going to give you glory and give you honor. Help me to develop a taste. I, I need to develop a palate for water, right? So I'm not drinking all the sweet tea. I'm not drinking the other stuff. God, give me a, ta- a, pa- a taste, a palate, an appetite for your word. Give me a palate, an appetite for goodness. Give me an appetite for righteousness. Give me an appetite for you being glorified. So I want you, I want us together, come on, we're going to do this together because we're one community. I want to, we're going to work on our appetite. So when somebody comes to you with gossip, you're like, I don't have an appetite for that. Somebody comes with negativity, I don't have no appetite for that. When somebody comes with an agenda, nope, I don't have an appetite for that. First thing I'm going to work on is appetite. Here's the second thing. The second thing I'm going to work on is activity, is activity. Um, In the same way that Paul writes to the church at Ephesus in chapter two, that their activities were evidenced by them walking with the sons of disobedience. That our activity was evidenced by us following after the ion of this age, the spirit of this age, the course of this age. God, I want my activity to be such that it is clear I'm your child. So my activity, whether it's my devotion life, whether it is my Bible study time, whether it's my prayer life, whether it's my family time, whether it is me speaking out against injustice. God, I want my activity to be evident that I'm your child. So first word, appetite. Second word, activity. And here's the third word, acuity. Third word is acuity. Lord, I want to be in a season. I'm about to pray this over you. Put me in a season where I develop my competency where I develop my intellectual sharpness, where I'm studying, where where I'm learning, where my skill set is getting better, where I'm being more effective, where I'm being more competent. 
Lord, put me in a space where you build my acuity. So those are three things I want to pray for us as we close Bible study. Thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. I'm going to pray with you before you go. Um, Share this with somebody. I hope it was a blessing. Comment on it if it was. Um, But again, Ephesians chapter 2, these first three verses, God is showing us how because of Christ we have changed for the better. Let's pray. God, you've been everything to us and we love you. And God, my prayer as we end this teaching is that you will put us in a season where I am working on my taste buds. I'm in a season where my appetite is changing, where my my desire and my taste for the things that honor you are increasing. I pray for our appetite. Secondly, God, I pray for our activity. I pray that we would stand up for the homeless, the poor, the widow and the orphan. I pray, God, for those who are marginalized, those who are oppressed. God, not only for those who are sinners, but for those who are sinned against. Help our activity to be in support of those you love. Help our activity to be clear that I am indeed a son of the Lord. And then I pray for our acuity, what we read. God, less TV watching, more book reading. Help my acuity to be sharpened. Help me to learn about my craft. Help me to learn about my trade. Help me to learn about spiritual things. Help me to learn to be a better father. Learn to be a better husband. Learn to be a better student. Learn to be a better friend. Learn, God, to be a better confidant. Learn to give counsel better. God, I pray for our acuity that we might become sharp, sharp, sharp in this season. Thank you for the but God. Can't wait to learn about it next week. All you're doing and for who you are, we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. You are changing for the better.